Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf. So just over a week ago I reappeared after months of absence and shared a video with you called On People and Borders in which I discussed another video about some first aid work that I've been doing lately with refugees, migrants and displaced people in France and Belgium. And then I asked for book recommendations on the theme of migration in order for me to understand this issue better. Impressively, quite a few of you did what I asked you to do and actually went and watched the Fast Calais video. I'm administrating that channel at the moment as a volunteer, so when you see Fast Calais, it is actually just me. So I can see all of the analytics on that video and there are about 200 views on it so far. And you can see this really clear spike on the day when I shared it on my Facebook and then again on the day when I shared it with you guys, which makes me feel far too powerful and also a little bit sad that it's not been found by anybody else yet, but early days. So thank you very much for that, I'm just hoping that it will help that channel to have a tiny bit of a profile to start out with um, and then we can use it to kind of build from there. I'm going to be uploading videos made by other volunteers every about every fortnight so you can always check back there if you are interested in hearing a little bit more about that kind of first aidy type stuff. And on the other side of what I asked you to do, in terms of coming up with recommendations, um, you actually also came up with loads of fantastic recommendations as well, so thank you again on that and thank you just generally for being kind of awesome people. So in terms of the books that were suggested, Jo Smith was by far the top contributor, thank you very much Jo. Her ideas were Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, which is a book that I've heard a lot about so I'm quite keen to pick that one up. Interpreter of Maladies by Jhumpa Lahiri, I think that one is at the library so it should be able to get hold of it. The Good Immigrant, edited by Nikesh Shukla, which I've got right here. And also The Lightness Sky by Gulwali Pasale. I'm really intrigued by the idea of that particular story, but it's available in the library, but then when I went it, they couldn't find it, so just hopefully it turns up soon and I'll be able to read that one. Debbie Baker suggested The Ship of Fools by Catherine Ann Porter. I haven't been able to find a copy of that just yet, but hopefully. Joe, as in Joseph Francis Burton, didn't have any book recommendations, but he did share some of his experiences in living near the Mexico border, so that was really interesting to hear. And finally, Ros Cook suggested African Titanics by Abu Bakr Karl, and that was the one that I chose to read first, for two reasons really. Firstly, convenience, so... Got it right here. Ros has read it, and I have Ros's old Kindle, so the book was already there waiting for me, which was quite handy. And secondly, because Karl is an Eritrean man who has himself undertaken this journey from Eritrea to Europe. So while I was in France, I worked with really a lot of young Eritrean men, or teenagers really. Actually one of the smaller camps in Calais is predominantly young men from Eritrea, so that immediately grabbed my attention towards this book. It just seemed very like intensely relevant to what I had just been seeing, so I was really glad to have it to hand. So African Titanics was published in Arabic in 2008 and in English translated by a guy called Cheris Bredin in 2014 by a publishing house called Daft and it tells the story of an Eritrean man on his journey towards Europe along with two particular friends that he makes on the way, a storyteller called Maluk and a woman called Terhas. Of course the Titanics of the title are the boats used to attempt to cross the Mediterranean. So this is a very short book, but like a lot of short books, it is very rich. I highlighted a huge number of quotes, but here I'm trying to only discuss the aspects that have the broadest applicability, because I know people won't necessarily read this or be planning to read this, so I thought I'd just highlight some more kind of general themes from it. This is where I take an aside to rant about how annoying it is to work on a review from a Kindle, because it's so easy to highlight stuff, and then it's so hard to like draw out those highlights and, and like review them in context and just function in the way that you would do with a paper book. I don't so much want to review African Titanic as to discuss the themes it brings out and how it conveys them, but before I get into that I feel like I have to make a bit of a comment on narrative structure. This book is described as a novel, but on my first read-through I was entirely, fully certain that I was reading a first-hand factual account. It really, really reads like someone is just telling you what has happened to them over the last few months with no filter, just pure, we went here and we went here and this happened, sometimes much more explicitly than I would have expected. Just a little uh, parental guidance warning there. At one point, the narrator is talking about his friend Maluk collecting stories as he goes along, and he says of these stories, they were a harmless jumble of events passed on by those who were afflicted, like him, with a compulsive need to hunt out strange events and paste them together into an ancient miscellaneous map. And I see that as a bit of a hint on what this book itself is, a collection of curious anecdotes strung together by one real narrator or a narrator who feels real. 
It's not the style that I'm given to expect coming from a novel. I've had this a few times with works translated from Arabic, and I'm always left questioning whether it's to do with the translation. There were definitely certain words that I thought could have been translated probably differently. Or whether it goes something deeper than that, whether it's about the actual style of the books themselves, and whether my lack of engagement with this style at times is something to do with me projecting my own idea of what constitutes a novel from a very western tradition onto narratives with an entirely different cultural background. I probably need to get on with learning Arabic in order to work that out. <laughs> I actually read African Titanics twice because of this feeling that I hadn't properly got it the first time when I was thinking that it was true, and on the second reading I did notice a lot more of what you could call literary features. Not necessarily the literary features that I'm familiar with, but certainly features that add to the power and the weight and the emotion of the story being told. So in that way I think that this kind of retelling style is deceptively simple. In terms of the themes of this book, the biggest and most generalisable theme is of course migration, that idea of that journey across the northern part of Africa, and the experience of being the person that is on that journey. Basically every other theme in this book ties back to that central one. Carl is very open with this theme, not only because it is the bones of the plot, but he also frankly speaks about the process of migration both in very factual tones and in more descriptive or mythical tones. For example, the very first sentence begins, Migration came flooding through Africa a turbulent swell, sweeping everything along in its wake." Having finished this book, what I really love about that line is that not only is it direct, but it's also symbolic, because it draws on this image of flood and swell, so rushing water, which comes into play later on with the sea. The page continues by linking migration to some kind of dark magic and to the tolling of a bell. He says, "...the depths of the bush began to tremble and shake, and wherever the sound of the bell reached, life would never be the same again." To me, coming at this sentence from an English perspective, the tolling bell called to mind a sort of funeral image and also bells ringing as a warning perhaps, so I liked that and I liked the sort of earth-shaking idea of that. Already I've talked a little bit about the narrator's voice and the way in which his voice is so real that I fully believed it, which in a way is the ultimate success for an author really, isn't it? You, you think that their story is true. Now I want to talk a little bit about the narrator as a character in himself and his experience of becoming and being a migrant, a person in transit. You may notice that I haven't named him yet. It's not that he doesn't have a name, but that he has too many names. On the blurb he's called Abdar, so for argument's sake I'm going to assume that that's his real name, but he only introduces himself in this way once in the book. Instead he is referred to by an endless succession of nicknames, ranging from Lion to Limpsalot. This really drew my attention because nicknames can be a term of affection, but they can also be quite reductive and undermining. They can contribute to your personhood, or they can take away from it. In our news, we're often hearing about migration in this kind of nameless, numerical sense, where there is no single identifiable individual, and almost by giving Abdar multiple names, Carl enables him to represent multiple facets, multiple stories in the crowd, from the disadvantaged child to the garrulous young man. In healthcare recently, there has been a bit of a movement to suggest that calling people by their name, their preferred name, is one element of treating people with dignity and respect. It's something that I personally quite strongly agree with and do try to act on. So when I was doing this first aid work, I found that people would come up to me and go straight into their complaint. They would almost reduce themselves straight away to a body part or to a wound or to the concern that they had, and they wouldn't seem to expect the person they were speaking to to go beyond that at all. So on my first day giving first aid, I have to say it was a completely overwhelming experience, and I really lost the sense of what I was there to do and be became very, very task orientated, and I just flowed along with the way that people came up to me. And that night when I got back to my hostel, I thought to myself, actually, this is not what I came here to do. I didn't come here to be like, oh, headache, paracetamol, okay, next. Like, that is never the way that I want to treat people. So from my second day onwards, I started making an effort to stop people after they'd initially said what they needed and say, okay, I hear what you're saying, my name's Matilda, what's your name? And doing that made me feel better about what I was doing, but I did notice that there would often be a huge hesitation before people actually responded with their names, as though they didn't know what to call themselves. And reading this book made me think about that a lot more and wonder if maybe there is a bit of a culture of nicknames and people were deciding sort of which name was the most suitable to give to a healthcare professional. And also about the fact that sharing your name with someone is an act of trust. 
Abdar only shares his name with the reader when he is telling it to the person who becomes his closest friend, Maluk, which is obviously an extension of trust towards that friend. And in general, with people trying to get to the UK, if there is an official record of you in any other supposedly safe country, the UK government will try to deport you back to there. So especially if you have a distinctive name, sharing that name potentially gives somebody the ability to put you at risk. So this book made me consider that a bit more. I do think on the whole, asking people their names tends to set up a better rapport, but I'm perhaps a little bit more understanding of the hesitations around that now. So going back to Abdar and his experience of his journey, he very quickly introduces us to the stresses of his itinerant life in the first chapter when he says, I remember feeling as though I was fated forever to continue my ceaseless roaming and that I would never again escape the endless road. This sensation of being helpless, being lost, being almost in a purgatory as it were, while present is not often explicitly voiced, but its contrast later on is when he reaches a point where he is no longer traveling. And he says, I had taken to sitting peacefully in Martyr's Square under the shade of the fountain of seahorses. I was no longer a migrant. I was simply a man. I find that very powerful because he's surrounded by these very bleak references to his journey, this idea of martyrdom and loss of life and the sea. And he's almost surrounded by the memory of his friends and the other people on his journey, but is himself divested of that and able to cease that perpetual motion and just relax for a bit and be normal. There is a very high level of tension in this book. There's the constant idea of onward on the journey. There's even a character who literally only says that. He only says, onward. There's a lot about how you make decisions under pressure, dealing with death on a practical level, trying to prepare yourself constantly for the hurdles of the next stage and the people that you might meet. So that little bit of breathing space for him as a character becomes all the more valuable. And I think that's something we should always be trying to offer, the opportunity to shed the tag of migrant and just be a human. In terms of being human, another thing that I would see as a key theme of African Titanics is humanity. Humanity in times of stress and humanity in times of crisis. The character who represents this theme most strongly, I would say, is Terhas, the main female character in the tale, who is introduced as this very maternal and caring figure who tries to look after those who come under her arm. She sets out travelling with a man called Asgerum, who is perhaps her husband or her brother, and she goes to very extreme lengths to try to protect him and to keep him alive, even when she is on the brink of death herself. Abdar comments on this, it was clear that she would not hesitate to give her life for his. And to me, that is the ultimate gesture of humanity, the ultimate compassion, that even in this desperate and otherworldly situation where they are lost in the desert, she maintains her love of Asgerum, a character who himself is both physically weak and psychologically vulnerable due to his history of being a soldier in a very brutal fight between the Eritreans and the Ethiopians on the border. Terhas is always the caring one in this story. She has her pragmatism, but she is able to cry, she is able to be emotional and loving at all times in a way that is productive rather than being a hindrance. Terhas is contrasted against the constant threat of something much darker, a bleaker and more monstrous side of humanity that can emerge in these high tension scenarios. And not even from the baddies, not from the smugglers and the bandits, but from the close friends and the fellow travellers who surrender to the pressure of the inhumane experiences, the people who lose themselves in a way. That's a theme that shows up pretty early on while they are lost in this desert, and members of their party begin quite rapidly to die of dehydration. And of course the survivors have to dispose of those dead bodies. Amazingly, they even find the energy to bury them. And then one of the passengers starts to suggest that they should bury the living, that they should bury Terhas, because she, like most of them, is very frail and at a point in which she could die. At this point the narrator gives him the benefit of the doubt and says that he must be hallucinating because obviously he can't be intending to say that somebody should be buried alive. But as the story goes on, these darker figures begin to creep up from time to time, particularly with reference to the boats where the most extreme of all of the experiences take place. For example, Abda makes one friend along the way with whom he shares the small stresses of missing coffee as well as the larger woes of homesickness. He describes him as having these beautiful sad eyes, but then things get desperate and he changes. During the catastrophic sinking of the boat, inner demons suddenly awoke in him. He became a monster. He plundered the dying. Bear with me on this. I came to reading African Titanics directly after rereading The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And to draw any kind of comparison between young adult dystopia and this fictional, but at the same time very real novel of African Titanics, 
does seem abysmally crass. I fully accept that. But the parallel was just too obvious for me to overlook when I was reading. As I've said, African Titanics feels like a retelling. Character development and pace are not the strengths of the book, they are not the focus of the book, so I don't have any criticism there. However, character and pacing in The Hunger Games is a very different story. The engagement with and relatability to the characters is an important reason of why I love the book, and it is a very emotive reading experience. And it gets you involved in thinking about the issues that the characters face from very early on in the book. The Hunger Games pushes people into an artificial survivalist scenario and poses the question, would you remain humane or would you become brutal if you had nothing left to lose but your own self? And that situation is very much like a very fictional version of what characters like Abdar and Terhas face. I would tentatively suggest that one of the values of lighter fiction, I say lighter because the themes are dark but the tone of this book is quite light, is that it can provide us with an inroad into bigger questions and bigger subjects. It can push us to consider darker themes for the first time, so that when we come to them in a more realistic context, we already have a little idea of how to deal with them and how to process them. One typical example would be how the death of a fictional character prepares us for grief. So what I'm saying is, I think it's possible that my emotional response to this boat scene was enhanced because it built upon my emotional responses to easier to handle scenes in The Hunger Games a few days before. My empathy built up in this book eased my empathy in African Titanics rather than shutting out this kind of extreme and quite complicated issue because it is quite an intense topic and I think it would be quite easy to just refuse to contemplate it as it were. Anyway, that brings me on to the ships, the African Titanics themselves. The book sets up a kind of duality between the desert and the sea, the two biggest hurdles between Eritrea and Europe, and then there's this constant question of which is worse, the desert or the sea. The dread of the sea and the horrors associated with it permeates the book from a very early stage. For example, the narrator pictures himself falling off a bridge into the Nile and drowning when he's at the very start of his journey, foreshadowing the idea that he could fall from a boat and drown towards the end of his journey in the Mediterranean. The sea is characterised as a female being, possibly a goddess, who sets out to trick those attempting to cross her. I think the name of this book itself goes some way towards that because this is, it is this instantly recognisable name that is associated with that combination of hope and despair, love and shipwreck. I'll just read you a little extract about that naming. Abdar is talking to a Moroccan sea captain about the coming voyage. Isn't it you lot that called the boats Titanicat, he continued. Titanicat being a pluralisation of Titanic. Yes, that's us. What else should we call them? Something optimistic, Noah's Ark perhaps, or any other ship that never sank? Well, what do you have to say for yourselves? What can we say? The matter's closed. Whatever. Just so long as you know that 70% of your Titanic hats sink. Only around 30 out of 100 survive. So I guess Titanic is an appropriate name for them after all. Titanic, he said with force, heavily emphasising the second syllable, transforming it into the Arabic word for fuck. Even those who had not heard the term Titanics applied to the boats routinely referred to them as the doomed. Apologies for swearing, but it's in the text, so. Do you ever get those days when it feels like everything is conspiring to stop you from making a video? So the sea in African Titanics is not always associated with doom, but also with an almost mythic power of resurrection. I've mentioned the idea of this story being a collection of tales, and one of those tales is that of Maluk's ancestor, who has a very interesting association with ships and the sea. One part of that is that after his death, somehow both he and his ship lived on in the form of a legend, a ghost ship as it were, and that legend comes to have a modern application in the story. There are other parts of this book that are about storytelling and how messages are passed on. As they reach different places, they sometimes find messages that have been left behind by the people who travelled there before them. Maluk travels with his guitar and he claims to have this gamble that he's going to return home with a great story of his adventure, in an image that reminds me a lot of the kind of of blue singer making a deal with the devil type motif. There are also multiple references to the news and whether it can be trusted, both the official news and word of mouth. For example, at the beginning, Abdar says, No sooner had the first ships reached the far shore with their small load of passengers than tales of them spread along the African coast and across the whole continent, travelling with the usual speed of all strange and wonderful stories. Reports of the unlucky ships that had sunk were naturally less welcome, swiftly and willfully forgotten in favour of happier events. 
I appreciated that kind of mythopoeic aspect of the tale, and the idea that people were spreading these things and turning them into a kind of living legend. Anyway, this has been a longer discussion than I originally planned because this was a short but fascinating book, and I feel like it has really enriched my idea of that journey from Eritrea to Europe. This is of course just one narrative of that journey, but one narrative is much more than what I was working with previously. It has stuck with me, I finished it about a week ago now, and I found that Carl's words have been much clearer and more powerful than my own in talking about this topic, which is natural because I'm an outsider to it and Carl is not, but I've used some of the symbols and and the ideas from this book when talking to people about the first aid work and about the reasons for having to do that. Because Carl's words are so much more authentic and evocative than anything I could produce. The next recommendation is going to be The Good Immigrant, this book here, which I'm working on at the moment, so I look forward to seeing, speaking to you again soon with something about that.